All right. Welcome, Jeff. We made it. <laughs> These are always fun. So I was just watching you on Twitch, building out Tags app, and then you're going to do a show and tell here. So I'm quite excited about that. Oh man! Um, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I, I I I like talking about the project. I like I like promoting that we can do more than the simple demo apps mm. with with all of the the .NET tools that we have in the box, right? Whether whether it's Blazor, ASP.NET, minimal APIs, SignalR, um, so much that we can do, and being able to do it in a realistic way that folks can touch and interact with and talk about it. It makes me happy to see folks get excited and say, Ooh, I want to do this. Hey, it'd be really cool if we could do that. And, and their reaction when it's actually shown on, on .NET con for another event. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, it's great to, um, to show, like you're saying that you can build stuff with it. It's also, you run into those little side cases where you're like, Oh, that didn't work as easy as I thought or whatever. Right. Oh, tell me about it, right? Like when when we think about the testing and the interactions that that not just us, but the engineering team for ASP.NET and Blazor, the, the steps that they go through in building and testing and working with the the framework as they get ready to to release .NET 7, .NET 8. There's only so many things that they're going to run into and try. Yep. It, it takes nuts like us that are going to get in there and, <laughs> and do things that are unexpected. Yeah. And yeah. and find those edge case scenarios where we go, you know what? This doesn't feel right. Hey, can we make this better? Mm -hmm. And and uh, th there's little things that, that we run into that provide good feedback and make everything better in the long run. Yep. Absolutely. Well, so we always start. So to those who are, are rating, jumping over from Jeff stream, this is the ASP.NET community standup. We do these every Tuesday. Um, we talk with people who are on the product team uh, at Microsoft building out cool stuff on .NET. We talk, um, we're lining up one soon to talk about the .NET 9 roadmap, a lot of like early previews on things. Um, we always start the show with community links. So I'll jump right in here. Um, so here's what we have for the week and I shared it in the chat and it's also here. Um, so let's go through them. So first of all, um, we just did uh, last week, we announced our vision for .NET 9. So this is our first, you know, like, hey, hey we're starting on the .NET 9 journey thing. Um, I'll put us over here. Um, <laughs> so some neat stuff. Um, one of the changes we're doing this time around, uh, so, a few things. One is we talk about some key focus areas. There's cloud native, there's AI. Of course, those are big, hot things. Um, Absolutely. Of course, also, we're still continuing to build out all, you know, the ASP.NET and Bla Blazor and Maui and all that. So some people are like, oh, you didn't mention Maui, yikes, you know, and it's like, those are all here. Those are all linked. Actually, we're doing, we're making some changes this, this cycle uh, to use the GitHub discussions. So actually, like, um, if I pop over into GitHub discussions, you'll see here, and this links out to all the different roadmaps, and you can actually interact and follow along directly there. So. What, what I like about this, John, is that we've pivoted from, from publishing blog posts that were release notes that were just, mm -hmm. here's a laundry list of features, to here's our vision. This is what we want to accomplish yeah. so that the non-technical folks get, get the same understanding of where we're trying to go with this instead of just, here's the features we're going to do and using GitHub discussions to go in and not just show here's the features, but being able to link directly to those issues. Hey, yeah. we address this. Hey, we took care of that. This thing over here works this way puts the technical discussion in a technical ecosystem that we're all comfortable with and can live as living documentation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this, like you're saying, it puts, separates the things out. So the blog is really talking about more, here's things you can use today and kind of, Hey, here's something that really requires your attention for the previews. People that are into the previews, they're going to be on GitHub anyhow, filing issues and, you know, all that g discussing the the feature development. So here's all the uh, individual announcements, the roadmaps, all that kind of stuff. 
one thing people asked about, you can follow along in, um, and so you can see already the discussion here. Um, there's Atom feeds for all of these, um, so yeah. which is cool. So you can subscribe directly to the to the discussions, um, and so and then you mentioned release notes, and it's kind of an anti pattern in the past. We were writing release notes in our blog posts, and they don't get updated. They're not localized. They're not you know the best really. You know, Remember, I was them. I was doing this back in 2016, 2017. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right, getting the message literally the night before. Hey, Fritz, we need a blog post to go out about the new release. Yeah. Like, okay, well, what's in it? Well, just write the release. Like, and yeah. and having to make up and put this together, and it was a pain in the neck to write. And and honestly, that's what what frustrated me and got me saying, you know what? Let me try streaming here, where I can actually be <laughs> interacting with folks. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, and then one other thing, just mentioning the release notes. So those release notes were, are actually going out now. Um, there are some here, but there's actually more in depth ones in the docs, and so we have these up to date ones. Um, so these are actually written um, by the dev team, but also the docs team works on these. And so that's cool. They're localized, they're updated, they're, um, there's a, a up-to-date list of what's new, and then also individual release notes for these. So hopefully this will make it better for everybody. I know, Jeff, you've probably run into this. I run into this all the time where I'm searching for something and I find the top hit or the only hit is in a preview to blog post and it's, it's like the worst this isn't going to be up to date no <laughs> if it works you no. know <laughs> so the, so these the the dev or the docs team really focuses on keeping this stuff up to date and if you um see something that's not up to date you can do feedback and you can actually like go down you can log an issue or do a pull request and it'll get updated so these these things are actually integrated in uh with uh GitHub collaboration and stuff. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. Love it. Love it. I, I, I'm eager to see how our community responds and interacts over the next few months as we build towards .NET 9. Cool, cool. All right, let me see. Um, one of the neat things, okay, so in .NET 8, uh, yeah. so at .NET Conf, we announced Aspire. Yeah. And James Newton King, like, apparently from what everyone said, he kind of just disappeared for a week came back and he's like, check out these dashboards. <laughs> right? You're talking about the, the Blazor dashboard that, that yeah. came with Aspire. Yes. But so, this, this. So cool. This is one of the coolest Blazor things I've ever seen built. And I've seen Steve Sanderson demos. But, like, but <laughs> this isn't, hang on, this isn't Blazor. This is Grafana, right? Yeah, that, yeah that's true. It's, the, right, it's, it's responding it's, to telemetry coming out of Aspire. Yeah, you're right. So, but it's integrated in, so, which is really nice because normally to hook all these dashboards and stuff up takes a ton of time. You have to do all this wire up. You have to say, why, you know, why is this not working? So th thanks for correcting me there that we've got the, the um, ASP or the Aspire dashboard is built in Blazor. Um, and then you can yeah. click through and you can get to those Grafana dashboards. And you can just stare at these beautiful moving charts as they go by. So. There's a little bit of configuration so that you can you can get the data logged, but it looks so good. Uh, John, I I I want to do this on on a live stream in the next few weeks. I I want to wire this up to Tag Zap. Oh, oh my gosh, it looks cool. so good. Yeah, yeah, it it looks good, and it's actually like really useful to be able to go through and dig through and say like what's going on in my app, you know, and, and understand, wow, when I do this, here's all these hits or here's, here's what's taking so long in my requests or that sort of thing. Let's, so. let's pin this article. Like, like, let's not close this, but okay. I want to come back to this when we, when we talk about tags app a little bit. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right. All right. I'll keep rolling through. Um, just, uh, you know, updates here. There's a uh, visual studio, uh, 16, nine and 16, 17. Uh, so here, yeah, seventeen nine, seventeen nine. They keep flying by, seventeen nine. I was reading something earlier on sixteen uh, the last year. Okay, so yeah, seventeen nine. Uh, so this is now available. That's exciting. Some of the issues uh, here. There's the AI Git commit messages. I've been using those, and also pull requests from Visual Studio. I'm I'm doing I'm I'm 
practicing doing that and doing my pull requests directly in Visual Studio. So I'll okay. create the, do the commit, do the AI uh, commit message and do the pull request directly in Visual Studio. Um, and actually it's been working pretty well for me. So I've been, I've been happy with that. Um, as, as, as a wise and elder statesman, yeah. I'm so used to typing it at the command line. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, that definitely works. And I've always got three three console windows open, but yeah. I'm always open to trying something that might be slightly faster. And totally. it is nice totally. in, in Visual Studio where it's already got uh, Copilot running and it already knows all the stuff in my commit. I do notice right now some of the commit messages take a little while and some of them are a little verbose, but it... <laughs> It'll write out like all my changes. Last night I was playing around with something and I refactored something into a, a service class and then I changed a bunch and it like explained, like it understood what I was doing and why I did it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So yeah, some neat stuff there. So this is in 17.9 and then 17.10, we also, oh my gosh. One of the Already. other things in 16.9 is this blazer scaffolding. Yes. So this is CRUD, so you can go, you know, we've had scaffolding for a while and other things. Nice to nice to have this in Blazor, so you can, you know, generate your stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> Neat. Uh, Very cool. So this one that I, I've tried to introduce several times, I kept forgetting this tab was a few later. 1710 preview one. Um, some of the stuff in here is more of the stuff in Copilot chat. So... Um, up till now, Copilot chat, you, you could chat with it, um, but it was, it was, you had to kind of ask the questions nicely. I felt like I was playing Jeopardy a bit. Oh yeah. Um, and now with this, uh, there's a little more here with slash commands and you can use a hashtag to refer to code. So that's pretty neat. You can say like hash home controller or hash something and, and refer directly to a, a class, a file, um, you can also with these slash commands, you can say add documentation or you know uh, mm. explain code. So so nice to be able to do that. And then there's some more in here too with the inline chat that they're building. Out, so now in in my experience, and folks who see me do this on stream, I've tried to jump into. I've got seventeen ten installed. Mm -hmm. um, this this breaks on me. Anytime that I do alt forward slash or I go to open the copilot chat window, it crashes Visual Studio on me right now. <clears throat> I'm chalking it up to something specific to my machine. Um, but right now this crashes for me. So, so a few things just because we're being nerds and we're nerding out together. Um, a few things that I do with this. One is make sure that you've got the latest. Th there was an extension update that went with 1710. Um, so when they did these, make sure that you update your extensions. Um, I will double get... check that right now. That's a good. So there's two extensions too, which is confusing. There's the GitHub Copilot. Oh yeah, look at them all. And Copilot Chat. Yep. So th so those are those are they need to be in sync, and I'm not sure why they don't just automatically do that better. Mm. But another thing, and uh, I thought I was sharing my screen. I'm not. Let me. Um, uh, another wild interesting thing i'll stop sharing my screen and then i'll reshare and i'll just share that window so it's share. blue it is. Purple. Okay. purple i'm i'm kind of proud of this jeff i made a an animated moving background okay it is fancy okay so here we go all right let's hide this uh add a stage hide that okay now, because I'm streaming, Visual Studio is going to be super slow. Um, there's a, a diagnostics thing that you can show. So one of the oh. outputs, yeah. So you can go to show output from, and mm -hmm. one of the things here is Copilot co chat. Ah. And so, yeah, and so so you can actually see as things are typing. So if I say, I mean, you'll see in here, I'm I'm doing stuff all the time where I'm like, could I, could I improve this code? What, what, or what security issues are here? Like all kinds of stuff. And um, as I'm typing, it'll say like, okay, this is enabled this, you know, this failed. Um, 
occasionally I've seen things where I'll ask something and I'll say this was blocked due to uh, potentially revealing, you know, personal information or whatever. But oh. so it's, it's all, um, oh, so that's anyways, interesting. that is a thing. There's, there's GitHub. Yeah. So there's Copilot and Copilot chat you'll see in the output. Hmm. Um, and there was so, a, so here, like it knows I'm, I'm a Microsoft employee, so it's showing crazy dog food to me too, probably also, but. Anyways, I, I use this a lot for debugging and, and diagnostics on there, too. Warm Peas yeah. was asking in, in chat when you w mentioned about generating a pull request uh, uh, commit message or uh, generating a commit message. It, would Can mm -hmm. you show that real quick while you're here in Visual Studio? Sure. Yeah, let me. OK, so I'll put us um, over here. I'm going okay. to. OK, so what here oh, I'm trying to move us around. OK. I'm going to go in here and I'll just say, um, what's a refactoring I could do? I'm going to um, try to think what I should do in the, this is Blazor. I'm going to go into my API because I was working there more recently. And Oh, I was going to say something like change the label at the top of, uh, change an H1, oh, okay. change the text, just something simple and see what okay. it generates. Okay, so let's go here and let's say um, P. Uh, uh, all right, so I'll say okay. that. I'll go into get changes. I'll say commit. And now once I do, I click on this little pencil thing. Okay. And it'll do generating message. Now, sometimes if I do a lot of change, it's, it's. Oh, and look it, at what it's typing over there in the output window. Yeah. Right. So I I'll watch this. Sometimes I'll be like, what is it even doing? And you'll see it's like going out and it's understanding. This is all the, you know, like back and forth. And then here, I'm not sure if I'll be able to zoom on this clearly. Let's see if I can do this. I'm trying to zoom. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So you're now, good. There, there it goes, you know, there's the. Um, Updated validation error message display. Yeah. Nice. And now I messed up my, there. Okay. I was scared. I was stuck in Zoom. But anyhow, it'll, it'll do that. Okay. So now um, let's say uh, commit stage. Okay. So now uh, the problem is generating a pull request. Okay. Let's do a new branch. Um, I was going to say that's that's as far as I wanted to go. But... Well, I'm going for it. For all right, all right, here we go. Uh, Jeff, okay, so I'm creating a pull request or a new branch. It sure. gives me the option to pull everything over here, so I'll do that. So I've been trying to use this whole just to try it out, see how it works. The entire um, workflow, doing everything in Visual Studio, right? Yeah. So now I'm going to push this up to my new branch. <coughs> And then after pushing it, it should let me, so it's initiating the push. Yep. And now yep. it'll say, okay, you created that. Um, now it says you can create a pull request. So I can say create in Visual Studio or create in browser. So I'm going to click create in Visual Studio. Okay. And then now it's got its new dialogue here. Okay. It's got this dialogue. Now also because of this, I've done some commits and I've seen sometimes it'll actually do more where it'll say, like here, if I click on this little guy here, um, it it sometimes will create the whole like thing for me, like based mm. on what I did. So, but anyhow. What, you know. What's the button there in the top left next to new pull request? Is that a just an this, icon? Uh, where are we looking No, no, at? just above that text box. Yeah, what's that gimmick? That's just an icon. That's just my gun. But so sometimes in these, it'll actually like generate like a whole like title and everything. Mm. So Worm Peas is saying we're way off in the weeds. This is awesome. Love it. Can I do this from the CLI? So one other thing to throw in here that I've been doing sometimes is I'll go into developer PowerShell directly in Visual Studio and I, I'll do the CLI stuff in here as well. So you can okay. pop up the Windows terminal, but I can do, you know, get status. Uh, whatever and it's it's all gonna i can do all my get commands directly in there too mm. so, yeah and also with this you can do multiple of them right so i can have multiple different um 
PowerShell windows open. So here yeah. I've got, you know, a few different ones. So anyways, I'm hogging the show and I want to learn more about Tags app. So let's get, <laughs> let me wrap up. All right, up. let's keep going through the links. I'll wrap up my community links. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so this was just neat. This is uh, Andrew Locke writing about uh, name pipes. So in .NET 8, there's more support for name pipes directly in uh, .NET. So in the past, you could kind of do it, but it was not easy. Um, he talks about how, uh, so Andrew works at Datadog, and he's, he talked about how they're using it there for, for ingesting stuff. Um, and uh, so talks about why use name pipes. These are some things I've always heard, you know, performance is a thing, but he talks about also integrating with Windows security, um, uh, impersonation, and um, I don't know, TC, you know, working around like TCP port issues. Uh, so okay. then, yeah, so then he talks about um, creating a name pipe. Uh, you can use in Kestrel directly, you can use listen name pipe, or you can do just HTTP you know, the protocol with pipe colon slash. I've never seen that before. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay. So anyhow, but, you know, by doing that, then you're able to, to work with name pipes directly. So neat. neat thing to know about if you if you ever need to use name pipes, support it directly in Kestrel now in .NET 8. And um, neat to see that it's that easy to do. So I have not written anything with name pipes for, over a decade, <laughs> right? So, um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've only got two more links before I pass over to you. Um, so <laughs> we've got this is neat, David Pine. I thought about this while I was watching your stream this morning, because you were doing, you were talking about content filtering and that sort of thing. You know, yes. like when you're monitoring, when you've got input from social media, people can put anything in there. You got to, you got to do content safety stuff. Um, so. David has been doing this cool stuff with a GitHub action in .NET, and uh, it's a profanity filter in GitHub Actions. Mm. So he's been doing this back since uh, .NET Core 2.2, and pretty neat. Um, we've both been, I, I'm like, when I get time to hack, I play with GitHub Actions in .NET. Um, I've been optimizing some stuff on the .NET blog with it. And so it was fun. David and I were trading, you know, little secrets and stuff back and forth. Um, we're both using Octokit. So he's using the new sure. Octokit SDK, which is neat. Um, and then he's uh, he talked also in here about using AOT to speed it up. So really? I'll scroll down to that a little bit. Yeah. So this is really neat. He's um, so that's kind of part of what he gets into in this is optimizing uh, native AOT compilation in a GitHub action, which is really cool. Yeah, um, I wouldn't. Yeah, it shows here. It's like, look at the speed. <laughs> Holy like, smokes. So I guess a use, a execution time was reduced by one to two minutes. So that's pretty awesome. <laughs> so anyways, he's, that's um, massive when we talk about GitHub actions. I, Git, yeah. Like I, I would think right the, the the advantage that we have as as managed language developers is after it does the just in time compile the first time it kind of caches it and it doesn't need to just in time compile yeah but i guess in, in it and i would think the github action it's just there and it's already but i guess if they're deploying and running a new instance of it the depends. github action in a container yeah. so a lot of github actions with dot net will actually pull and build the dot net code it's not running from an image, it's running from the source. Right. Um, and so in order to do that, it's actually compiling it every time it runs. It's not running off a compiled image. It, it's time. it's building the code to run the action every time? Every single time. That's, wow. I mean, that that is how, so, yeah. So, um, so but by do, doing AOT, um, and I haven't done yeah. it, um, but yeah, so look at this, you know, here he's got, he's got it filtered out, um, so. I actually, this was funny. I I made the suggestion. I was happy he took it. I said I would like to be able to use, add my own words for testing or whatever. If I have my own profane word, I want to add to your list because mm -hmm. he's doing. So here he created one that said uh, web forms was, you know, was profane, which, you know, some people <laughs> may say. And so there it, it, hey. it, it out. <laughs> some of us so, worked on that lovely product. There you go. 
So this this is really cool to dig into if you're writing um for people to know you can write GitHub Actions with .NET. It's a really nice experience, and especially with the new ArcticKit SDK. And now I've talked way too long. This is I'm going to turn it over to you. This is my last link, which is the Tags app. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. What are we doing with Tags app? So okay, <clears throat> many many months ago, um, we ran into a problem where we were getting ready. We were planning for .NET Conf, and we were looking at how we interact with chat, how we how we interact with the viewers. And we, we used an application that would connect out to Twitter, bring back messages and put them, put them on screen so that hosts could take a look and, and kind of drill in on the, the, the collection of what's going on in the universe that's talking about .NET Conf. And on Twitter for, for many, many years, that's a wonderful thing. That's a really cool experience. There's so many things going on out there. It really was the internet's town square. And in 2022, just before .NET Conf, uh, things changed. <laughs> things changed yeah. significantly with, I'm still going to call it Twitter because it's Twitter to me, friend. I still do. <laughs> it still works. It's Twitter. still tweeting. Works still, yeah. <laughs> I, John, I still have a Twitter icon on my phone there you go well um, so, you know uh, I, I agree with you on that that twitter definitely got weird during that time but also even yeah. before then it was a little bit separated because we had comments going uh, we had the the video stream going on yes. youtube yes we had youtube comments coming in yes but then we told people don't don't you know and twitch on, right on twitter. yeah right yeah so people are watching on, on Twitch. Three places YouTube. that we were getting comments. Yeah, exactly. But we could only, our, our app only worked with, I believe, Twitter. with Twitter. So yeah. it was kind of a weird experience. There. And and we saw so many folks over the beginning of 2023 into late 2023 pick up and say, you know what? I'm leaving Twitter. I want to go to Mastodon. I'm going to go to Threads. I want to go to Blue Sky. And when huge chunks of your technical community are somewhere else than where you're listening, that's a problem. So what do we do about that? Well, we went back to our, our vendor and we said, Hey, you're on Twitter. Can we go to other places also? No. Okay. Well, um, we, we talked about it. We, we went back and, and it was clear to us that the interactions from chat was something that that our team had been demonstrating since like 2010 with David Fowler and Damian Edwards showing things with Signal R, right? The the old um they didn't call it chatter. What did they call it? They had a chat app. Jabber. Jabber. That was Jabber. it. I that was funny. That was for a while. That was people were hanging out on Jabber and they're all yeah. pictures and yeah. We had MVPs hanging out on Jabber and chatting with the .NET team. And it was it was all Signal R on a website running yeah. on Azure. And it, that was very cool. But we kind of looked at that and said, why don't we do this with Mastodon and Twitter? And then we can, we can get the content from both of those. Well, Twitter changed their API and that was a paid thing. And mm -hmm. we, we learned how to work around that. And I... I I said, let me take a month and see what I can come up with. Let me just take a month, tinker with this, see what the API can do. And and folks, if you joined from the raid on my my YouTube channel and Twitch stream, you've seen me working on this since July. We 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 picked up tools and said, hey, let's connect out and work with this. And we got it working with Mastodon very quickly. But it became clear that if we wanted to work with Mastodon in Twitter, there's other social media services out there we want to connect to. Mm -hmm. So we put together a little interface, I social media provider that knows how to connect into these other, these other providers. And we gave a nice screen with, with messages there, but now here's all the places that we can listen to and get messages, right? Um, th there's a social media service out there called Blazot that's built with Blazor. The, the folks that run that built a provider and sent it over. We just finished Blue Sky integration this week. Of course, Mastodon, Twitter. 
why not listen to Twitch chat and YouTube chat? And yeah. and our friend Javier Lozano and I said, you know what? It's it's great that we can support these social media sites, but what about just putting a text box on the front of our event site so you oh, don't have to log in? Yeah. Right? Just give me your name right. and your yeah. we'll pass it through. So he wrote a client that puts a message into an Azure queue, and I wrote a little provider that listens to that queue and puts messages on here. Nice. nice. So, so what sounds neat too with that custom message delivery is that could hook into anything. You could get that from a text message or from an email or whatever. You know, what I mean from your website or your whatever your interaction. Is. Keep yeah. going, John. <laughs> uh Jabber. Yeah, definitely. You jabber. could get it from Jabber. You <laughs> could get it from WhatsApp. You yeah. could get it from um um teams. what's the other one out here of course teams <laughs> you, you could get it from teams yeah. right you could get it from um i forget the name of this application you could get it from signal wow. text messages yeah. i've yeah. we've got friends who work at twilio who we can certainly work with and hook up so you can send a text message in why not like you might not always use it but to be able to say hey you want to communicate you want to send a message into the show Send us a text at. Oh, we get people are coming up with ideas now. We had uh, somebody said Slack. Somebody said uh, IRC. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Nice. Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Right. Okay. So, so can you show off what Tags app looks like today? Can I show it off? Now let's see. Um, let's see if we can we can do the thing with the stuff. It <laughs> is. Do I have a window running? I do. Discord, of me, course. Yeah. We were just working on it. Oh, okay. Funny you should say that. Let me let me see if I can do a share screen here and get this. All right. Get this working I've window. Got uh, and I'll see if we can get that. How's that look? Uh, looks great. Okay. Let me switch over. <clears throat> there we go. So. TagZap is intended to be very configurable. It's open source. It runs in a container and it's a Blazor application. But I didn't want to just build a Blazor application. I wanted to take this and make it stretch. And like we were saying earlier, use all different parts of Blazor. So what you're seeing is a static page that's that same waterfall view. If you watched um, .NET Conf, you saw this view and it's configurable and it brings in and it's got a light and a dark mode. We primarily like dark mode here, but we can, we can click through and bring up messages and they show up with a little modal here. It also generates an overlay that we can use uh, with a TriCaster, with OBS, and embed in our video that we broadcast. So as you click into a message here, if I wanted to tab off and still have this message pinned to the bottom of the screen, we can do that. We can, that that is available as an optional feature to add into this. And it, it shows you in the corner where the messages came from. Most of these messages I was broadcasting on Twitch earlier. So you see Twitch messages, but you see, I've also got blue sky messages coming in as well because oh, it's got the, cool. the butterfly there's other messages i believe that came in from mastodon here's one from our friend cecil right about the dot net aspire preview and you see it's got the mastodon tag and it brings through the preview images that were shared on mastodon also we can't really do preview preview images on twitch or youtube chat but those services that do support images that's a nice feature. Yeah. So maybe we get to a point of supporting Instagram. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's, there's a way we can have Instagram images pass through and they show up like this. So this is, this is nice to have this view. And this is right now our primary view for hosts to be able to interact. It's, it's touch enabled so that when you're working with the big touch screen, right, a host can just touch whatever image, whatever card they want to open up and take a look at. But we've also got a moderation screen that goes with this. So this, this is great for because so the the way I've used this is at .NET Conf. I'm for a little bit. I'm a host in between sessions, right? And I'm doing yeah. Q and A. Yeah. And I 
I want to be able to click on these and, and say like, hey, we have a, a great question from Robert Tables here, um, you know, click on it. And But I don't want to have an embarrassing message on the screen behind me, right? I need to have a moderator behind the scenes, like making sure the best ones are, are at the top of the list. Yep. Right. Yep. So what's great about this then is we can choose messages to, to flow through. And you see right now there's only one moderator logged in, but it, gosh, John, when we were working during .NET Conf, cause we were getting so many messages, mm -hmm. there were three or four of us and you saw our gravatars pop up there next to the current moderators here. So while it's searching for a hashtag on Twitter and Mastodon, it's listening to all the chat on Twitch and YouTube and filtering that through here. Now, I've only got this configured. Can can you slide our, our images down to the bottom so yeah. that folks can uh, see the, the top of the screen here? Th ah, there we go. Thank you. Yep. So we added filters up top here. So I could say, well, only show me the Mastodon messages and I can turn those off and it'll reload. And here's just the messages from Mastodon that are it, right now in my test instance here, I'm searching for the .NET hashtag. So this is great for, for us to be able to see what's going on out there, be able to approve and, and send messages through that we might be interested in. And of course I can take a look at just the rejected messages if I want and oh, see nice just those. And we just one. added this blur feature. I saw you doing that on stream. That was cool. That's CSS based, huh? Yeah, right? We know how to do CSS blurring. So let's just bring it through to here. And what I, I was explaining over on the other stream, what we didn't expect that we learned during .NET Conf, the .NET Conf hashtag went trending on Twitter. Consequently, we started right. to see other people that wanted to get their message out and seen by more people starting to use the .NET Conf hashtag. And there's content there that we don't want to see. Yeah. So how do we handle that? Well, there's several things. And you can see over here, there's a message over on the far left um, from Paul Kogan. It's got a little, and even right here, just above me from Dev Leader. And you see how it's got the uh, got a blue cloud on it. Mm -hmm. that's Azure content safety that's reviewed oh. and said, you know what? This has a violent context to it. I've detected with a medium amount of certainty that it's got, that it has a violent reference. I'm rejecting it for you. So we've got a plugin that'll automatically reject. It doesn't approve content, yeah. but it automatically rejects content for whatever reason. And it flags it and it says, I did this, that the machine made this decision. That's a great application of AI that we learned about mm -hmm. building this feature. And because it's open source, you can learn about it too by taking a look at the source code to tags app. That Azure content safety is such a neat service and really okay. pretty easy to hook up to. You send it, you send it content, you send it text or an image or whatever, and it'll flag based on like four or five different things. Yep. So you yeah. can see one here, violence. You see over there on the far left that there was a sexual connotation that was detected. Another one that was detected that was hate. Mm -hmm. And and we had zero tolerance for some of those things. So we set the, the level very low so that if it detected anything, block it by default. And we we started to see some of our moderators get a little uncomfortable with some of the content they were seeing. So adding this blur feature today was something that made sense for us mm -hmm. so that if it's already been rejected by some by somebody else, you don't have to look at it. What we what? did add was a little eyeball reveal oh, feature nice. so that if you wanted to double check, mm -hmm. you could bring it back. And there's also a confirmation here if you if you accidentally click approve on it, well, are you sure you wanted to put this back in the mix and get in? So taking steps to make sure that our hosts, our moderators, our viewers feel included and safe, utmost importance, utmost importance when we try and include viewer generated content. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's nice too, because like, this is great to like automatically it fails on the safe side. It's going to flag stuff. 
Yeah. And then I can go in, I can say, wait a minute, I know this person that, that probably, and then I can take a look and give it a double check, but I'm exactly. not going to, yeah. And they may exactly. say like the violence could be some, something saying like, kill it with fire or, you know, exactly. Like, I hate this kind of code. Well, it's like, okay, but you know, you fail on the safe side. Totally. And, and if you as a moderator don't want to look at it, you don't have to. Nice. So, nice. So that's a little bit that we can do with moderation. I, I showed there, right, the waterfall appears. We had information that popped up, not trying to derail. Oh, okay, fine. But we, we had information that would pop up here, and we had a cool .NET conf background to the back of, those, of that pop-up. So while that's neat, and, and we can change up the header here, there's configuration for all of this. So, right, I can customize that header. Right now I have it green. We can make it, right, uh, let's make it blue. Sure, not welcome to the app. Um, hello, ASP.NET uh, community stand-up, right? And it's, it's all marked down. So we can punch that in there refresh and now we get the new configuration right. so anybody can build and set up how they want that modal right now i had it with like purple behind it well we just built this over the last stream so you can put whatever text you want on the back of it this is from chat i don't like times new roman let's make it <laughs> let's make it impact and uh let's make the background let's make it a nice bright blue uh, that's the font color no Oh, no, no. That was the background. Yeah. 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 Um, and let's make the foreground. Let's make it like a yellow like that. Uh, sure. Save those <laughs> changes. And now when I go back over here and refresh and reload. Comic Sans? Fine. You want, uh... <laughs> or Papyrus. <laughs> no, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me, John. So uh, funny it didn't pick up comics. It's MS Comic Sans, isn't it? Yeah. Is it like that? And it may need to be quoted or something. There's, it's weird. Is it like that? No. Mm. Like that? Maybe, maybe content safety is kicking in. <laughs> Don't do that to me. I know this one works. <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh, that's a um, good question from Sean here. Was that color picker? How'd you do that? Is that built into? That's input type color. That's a standard thing in the browser. You know... It's it's funny we forget about that, but they, they've had all these form input types in the browser for a long time, and people like are always using you know custom ones, JavaScript or React or Blazor yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So the last thing that we did with this that I really like is I can also now upload a background image. Nice. So I'll upload my logo, and boop, there it is. I can specify how I want it laid out. I'd like it contained, don't repeat, put it right in the center, save those changes. And now, now that I have that admin config, is it Comic Sans MS? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. um, right, I open that and now I get my logo with the background color because I put it on a transparent background That's and it cool. comes through. Nice. Yeah. So what we're trying to do, make it customizable, make it something, and it, it's, I, I've specified the name up there, uh, right? So it, right, you wanna change the name of it, save that, refresh, and it takes the new name. So we, we wanna make it customizable, something open source that folks can learn from. Um, some of our friends, uh, Rich Ross and, um, Oh my gosh, I'm forget, forgetting it. Space Shot, Chris Gomez, an MVP. They're taking the source code for Tags app and setting it up so you can build with a dev container. Ooh. So if you want to contribute, you want to learn about it, yeah. you can get a great development experience where it'll set up the database for you and get things ready. And you can build inside a container without having to do a lot with it. Okay, so you mentioned development experience and all that. This yes. is a really cool looking app. I want to see the code. Like, how'd you build all this? Sure, let's do it. Yeah. So um, there's my issue that I was working on. So back here in GitHub, right? Everything's on GitHub. Um, you can see the entire application here. There are packages for, for this that are out there. Um, if you want to download a container and run it right now, 
It's right okay. here. So what and and when we were running for .NET Conf, we actually were running off of a container that was deployed into Azure and uh, on App Service. So App Service, when it saw an update to this repository, to this package repository, it automatically downloaded and redeployed and restarted the container. So we were able to patch things if we had an issue immediately and nobody was the wiser. So go ahead and clone and pull that down. You can run it locally. Wow. There's um, a bunch of code in here. Where's the little code browser button that's supposed to be over here? Um, if you want, I mean, you can just hit your dot, hit the period key. And ah, there it goes there. Oh, that guy. Yeah. So um, it, there's a ton of projects in here. And it's it's grown over time. I've got a series of unit tests that I've fallen behind on maintaining. Um, we've we've learned that we wanted to put together view models that are just those things that we pass from the server into WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. So when I was showing the screen over here with all these messages. These messages that we're showing here, they're clearly, that's a model that we want to pass back and forth between the WebAssembly component and the server. So I want to make that <clears throat> very small. Don't include the other things that you don't need in WebAssembly. So we put mm -hmm. together a project, it's just a class library, that contains these, these models that we're passing back and forth. So that right, so we minimize the the footprint of our .NET code in the browser. Okay. So that was was something that was important for us to do, um, and everything's in right now. The running application is in Blazor and then Blazor client. Um, I, I've gotten to a point where I've recognized that when you do a file new Blazor web app, you have the ability to put all of your components and pages in this WebAssembly project, this project that'll be delivered for WebAssembly. Okay. I've gotten to a point where I'm always going to generate that, whether I'm going to use WebAssembly or not, mm -hmm. and I'm going to, by default, start my development experience putting my pages and content over there because it's easier to move them back to be moving that page and component back to be only server rendered that it's easier to do that than to go and add the component the the client project later there is currently there isn't a way to say oh add a blazer client component project an, an interactive web assembly project to my solution you can't do that so you okay. end up doing file new project Create it with interactive web assembly, grab that project and migrating it over, and it's it's a mess. So I've I've kind of leaned into that and I've been folks that have been watching me on stream, you've seen I've moved components and pages back and forth between these two projects. It's nice to have that power, but mm -hmm. it's also sometimes confusing. And I wanna I wanna make sure folks are aware of that, you know. So now you mentioned that, that makes me wonder, like, how are you taking advantage of some server-side rendering or some of the modern .NET 8 features? Oh, or, yeah. Oh, yeah. So some of that code? So if we, uh, let me show you the experience, and then we'll come okay. back. So um, here on the moderation screen that you see up above, there's no reason to push this down into WebAssembly particularly as I look at the filter buttons up here, mm. right? I, I'm okay with just having all the messages and have this come off the server. That was my initial thought. But as I interact with each one of these messages, I want high-speed performance and returning on that. And the pause button down there, I want that to behave and respond immediately. In order to do that, we need WebAssembly. Okay. So th this is the Franken page because the outside of it, the header is static server rendered. The top bar here is server interactive and the content inside is WebAssembly. Like literally I'm doing everything to, to kind of bend and break this. So if you take a look at the moderation page, right? Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I actually pushed this to full interactive 
uh, WebAssembly. I did have it as server at one point. Okay. But the layout that this sits on, right, that, that it sits inside of, um, that's static rendered. All of the admin pages that you see over here, particularly mm -hmm. like the list of users, um, this is static rendered. But my list of providers that we have here, and right now I have these six providers available. Mm -hmm. This is all um, server interactive. So I'll jump over to that, right? I mean, look at all the code here. Let me just close everything. It's like it, it's like I'm showing you an unmade bed in my bedroom. <laughs> They're all open like that. Um, right, so if I go to, I believe, uh, components, I forget if it's under pages or admin, uh, not account, admin, pages. Yeah, here we go. So this is the outer provider page. And it, it's showing here's the list of all the providers. Um, that's included here. And this is an interactive server page. But it loads up configuration for each one of the providers that are sitting down here inside the client, right? So mm -hmm. admin, there's all the provider user interface. So we can look at here's the Twitch chat config and I haven't specified. So this is all interactive server pre-rendered, right? Because okay. I, I don't have that render mode directive. So this is all interactive, uh, interactive server so i can open things like the blue sky configuration right now it just has an enabled checkbox or mastodon and there's my mastodon configuration i'm gonna check for content on mastodon.social every five seconds and it's enabled and i can add http headers if i want and my configuration for twitch and i have secrets embedded here turned into password fields and these are specific to each one of these providers because each provider has different things they want and they call these these configuration options different things and it's it's just a mess to have to deal with yeah so we we tried to do this with some reflection and um i'm looking to see is he still in chat i saw him earlier um there was uh, Napalm Codes, there he is, um, did a ton of work to build the initial version of this page. And it was phenomenal and used reflection to build out the models for this. And it worked it, it worked really good. But as we started building more features and we want to interpret and do more with it and kind of derive and be smarter about it, trying to be smarter on top of clever code that uses reflection ju yeah. just violated concept count for me. It was like, I can't think through this anymore. We said, yeah. you know what? Time to pivot and just hard code some of this. And it it works great. We have an easy way for folks to add new component, new providers to extend the capabilities of Tags app. And I'm 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 really proud of what our our little streaming community has been able to do and figure out and grow this. So so you mentioned those providers and had a question on that. Like, how can can you show what's involved in a provider now? Let's do it. Um, I think an easy one to look at is Mastodon. So Mastodon, right? It's it, Mastodon's that same type of Twitter-like social media wall mm -hmm. of content, right? And and you have a hashtag out there that you're going to search for. So for Mastodon, let's let's jump into the. Uh, come on now, Mastodon provider. So there is a little project out here, providers Mastodon, and it's it's got some configuration that's available. Let me let's close everything else. Close all but this, right? Thank you. And I'll pop open the provider as well. So all each one of these implements an interface. Right. This is th this is like object oriented design 101. And it's so great to have an example like this that folks can learn from because it adheres to some of those object oriented um, um, practices that we learned so long ago. And to show this makes great sense. Mastodon needs to query on an HTTP endpoint. So we pass in an HTTP client factory. We pass in a logger so that we can log information and we want to pass in, well, what's our configuration? And our configuration 
I, I added some information here, like what's the section, where does it save that data to? Description and a name of the provider. So we can show those on a user interface. Um, is the provider enabled? And I also have, where is it? The base URI, base address. There it is. So uh, yeah, base address, where's the property for that? Oh, it's coming off of, so this is, part of a, a larger set of options called HTTP client options okay. that has things like a base address, a timeout, a collection of default headers to interact with. Should we use HTTP2 to interact with that? But the provider itself, once it's been created, I have some other description information. So if you're interacting with this, you can reach in and grab that data. Mm -hmm. But um, each one of them is called Hey, go get content for this hashtag. Go get me some data. And it'll periodically, Tag Zap will periodically call this. So underneath the covers, what it's doing, and I've got some test data here loaded, um, it's going to go get from that target URI a collection of, in this case, Mastodon messages. So I deserialized the Mastodon message into it, I didn't deserialize, right? I did the um, JSON to C sharp class, and yeah. I ended up with this object that that mirrors what the Mastodon message format is. Okay. So I need to convert that into tag zap content. So I just do a reformat here. Um, just there wrap it is. those properties. Yeah. Just wrap those properties and turn them into a tag zap message. So the provider, this is Mastodon that, that's delivering this. What's the ID of this message that's coming through so we can refer back to it? Um, this is a message bit of content because I want to be able to support chat messages, images, audio, video coming through in case we want to hook up to something, something like SoundCloud in the future. That might be cool to do. Um, information about the author, including their profile image URI, so we can put your smiling face there next to your message and if there's a preview card that came through well, show me information about that oh. um there's also the ability to i don't no this one doesn't do emoji um youtube and twitch also support emoji uh, coming through yeah yeah so um and i have a little health status here and that's where what you were showing earlier about the grafana dashboards yep. i want to hook this up to that yeah. So I could see cool. Mastodon's finding messages, Mastodon's querying. Yeah. And there's six of these out here. I want to know that they're doing work. Yep. Wow. So that's that's yeah, all that's great to have that, that dashboard, right? And get that heads up view. Um, a few questions that brings up for me is go for it. Does this make sense to use with Aspire or is it kind of more like a monolithic app where it doesn't? Or what, what's when the... when our friend Brady Gaster saw this, he said, dude, dude. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Let me yep. show you Aspire. And then yep. he said, where's Orleans in this? Oh, I don't have Orleans in this. Yeah. Do. <laughs> Brady. We got to talk. You know how Brady does that. <laughs> Brady, I love you like a brother from another mother. We got to do that. And and those are things <laughs> that makes perfect sense to get in here. And yep. I think when we aspire a FI tags app, mm -hmm because we'll be able to wire up and say, oh, you need a Postgres database because that's the one that I've primarily been developing with. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need a Redis cache and being able to have that F5 experience, right? Yeah. Um, and, and have it automatically generate the Postgres database, automatically do my EF migrations on it. John, I think you're right. It, there's there's absolutely in a spirification. Is that a, is that a thing <laughs> um, that we need to do with this? That'll make it make it easier. And I think when when we look at where these are hosted right now, um, they're all hosted in memory for the web server. Uh -huh. So if I go back here, I have uh, service providers. There are startup methods for each one of the providers. But we then register those services and then they get set up in the background mm -hmm. as hosted services. Uh, let me do a control F12. So I go to an implementation there. So uh, I'll go back to Mastodon. It, it sets them up 
So they're sitting out there as a, well, as a, it's a transient object out there and it's just running on its own thread in the background inside the web surface. Now for just little me running here, not getting that many messages, not bad. We may want to move those out into microservices. All okay. things that we can do to take what is right now a monolith and we're ready to break that up and move those to other places, hook up with a service bus, whether it's mass transit, Azure service bus, what have you. Uh, maybe even a vent grid might be might make more sense and have them connect and deliver uh, and and interoperate with each other. Okay, so. I am seeing real quick, there is a Visual Studio. So we're, I think, going to get kicked off <gasps> of Twitch. Oh, no. Yeah, there's, there's a, another show coming. There's a Visual Studio toolbox starting now. I think we're allowed to stay on YouTube. Um, but so uh, let me check with. Um, sure. Uh, just, yeah. We'll just edit this out and post. <laughs> See if they can kick us or you know so for people watching on twitch um you can jump over to the dotnet youtube i'm gonna see if i can manually drop our twitch off so that we're not blocking them from from going but there's still some cool stuff you're showing so for people that do want to watch this will all still be in the in the youtube so yep. let's see if i can remove us from visual studio twitch again if you're watching jump out and you want to see this or if you want to catch up later um, we're on the um, .NET YouTube. And if you want to stay around for Visual Studio Toolbox, great stuff there too. So uh, apologies to them. And uh, let's see how that works. I'm removing from the Twitch. Let's see if that goes. All right, let's see. I think we have dropped off. Um, pasting in the YouTube link, that is a good comment. And then we'll... If you've we got a few more minutes, Jeff, there's some absolutely for you. Control. I've got five. <laughs> okay, they already posted it over. Awesome. All right. So, so you were showing there were a few interesting things you showed in the code that you went by. One was you had sure. JSON property mm. order or something. There was a JSON property in the I think it was the HTTP client or the so I have JSON ignores hanging in here. There was also and yeah, I have JSON property order, name. JSON property order. See those? Yeah. Uh, Seven. What is going on there? So I want to push those so that they appear at the bottom of the collection when it gets serialized. Right. I don't want these to be at the top of the order. Okay. The things that are specific that have been added on to this base class, I want those to appear first. And then these types of things that are going to be reused in a bunch of places, push them down to the bottom so it becomes easy to, to locate those inside the JSON when I work with it. Okay. Now, right. the JSON for this, I have it actually saving out into a table. Let me open Azure Data Studio because I know, I know you want to see the database. I do. Um, Very excited about this data. So it's it's connecting and sitting here in a local container. So you can see I have uh, the .NET Conf container hanging out there. I have we our initial test, our proof of concept with this was, hey, can we listen to can we listen to the NFL kickoff game and handle that load? And oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, so those annotations, I'll show you how they result here. Uh, no, not it's uh, yeah, Postgres schemas public, that's where it is. Tables, and then down here is my system configuration, and they're all saved as JSON blocks here inside my uh, my database. So let's go to the Mastodon configuration right here. So it pushes so the only thing that that's um that's been added is, is enabled. The other configuration options are pushed to the bottom from that JSON order by. So they're the last ones. So I know I'm not gonna have a hundred entries. So yeah. it, because I said the first one is 100, I have them appear in the order I want 
down at the bottom. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. There, there was one other interesting thing you went by in the code. Um, there was on the provider, the Mastodon provider, there were two interfaces. And the second one was like, I has latest ID or something like that. Yeah. What is going on? I has newest ID. newest ID. Come on, John. I has newest ID. That's very <laughs> descriptive. Yep. Right? Um, so it had it's a provider that's returning a newest ID. With Twitter and Mastodon and YouTube to a certain extent, there are um, marker ID numbers that you have for for when you perform a search, here's the most recent one that you found. So by doing this, what I can do is I can track, here's the latest ID that I found. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes back to do the next search, it can pass in that, uh, that search, that, wow. that ID so that it says, okay, get me the latest stuff since Oh, that which is which is important when you're querying all these providers you don't want to be getting a lot of duplicate information exactly so. because right. in the in mastodon they don't really care how much searching you you're doing mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to say well only go back this far twitter yeah. charges you per message they deliver yeah yeah so if if you can minimize the number of overlap you're in you're you're saving you're literally saving money okay so they yeah wow. a, uh, an interface that saves you money it works nice so. nice well w okay so so this is a ton of great stuff um i know you've been streaming for a few hours before starting this oh yeah um, i want to make sure when we wrap up that we go into how, you know how people can get involved in the project is there anything else in the code you want to show off that's interesting exciting so on the way something that that we figured out and we learned when you're building an application that you want to run from a container we see this with like wordpress right when you download wordpress and you start it up there's kind of a first start boot up experience how mm -hmm. do we do that with asp.net core like how can we detect that we're missing configuration? We're in the first startup experience. How does that work? So what we did, you'll notice I'm using the old static main startup configuration here. Mm -hmm. I'll get into this in a second. Um, so static main calls, I, I just called it start website. And down here, I injected the ability for it to say, that we're in startup mode and to use, and look, see, I've still got stuff um, that that has been commented out. Where is it? There's a startup wizard that gets launched and I'm, I'm having a hard time oh, finding it. Why, I, now I get what you're saying. Yeah, first run experience, basically. Exactly, that first run experience. Did I put it in security? Where is it? So this the, is the first time you run it and says, hey, welcome. You yes. Need to figure these options. Yes, you exactly. Your Create your admin user. That's so I put a bunch of extensions methods on here. And uh, nope, that see that that was a piece that I removed. Um, but it was called first start configuration. Let's go find that. Just go find that thing because I know it's here. Um, because I, what I did was I mapped to it. Um, yeah, should start first start configuration. Go find me where that came from. Cause I forget how I built this. Um, yeah, where else go find that? I did a thing here. Um, no, 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 that's razor properties. I don't remember where I put this. It, it redirects you to it. So it's checking if is configured. Yeah, is configured. Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. So I have a configure. I, I wrapped system configuration with this thing that I called the configure factory. Okay. And it returns a basically a wrapper around configuration because I want to be able to put configuration in many different places. 
I want it to come from the standard ASP.NET configuration places. Oh, I want to be yeah. able to put it in Key Vault. I want to be able to put it in the database, most importantly. Mm -hmm. And by default, ASP.NET doesn't read from a database. So I wrapped the configuration capability and I added a property here that says, well, is it configured yet? Okay. By default, it's false. But if we're, we are able to load configuration, maybe it reads from in memory. Maybe it reads from somewhere on disk. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We're going to mark if it's configured. If it's not configured, we're going to say, well, we should start the first configuration. And I'm going to not render the body of the website. But instead, I'm going to render this page for start configuration that says, hey, let's do some initial configuration. And there's basic configuration, advanced configuration. So you could say, well, where do you want to store your application configuration in data about the various content providers? You can put it in Postgres, nice. SQLite, in memory, and yeah. so on and so forth. That so is a really cool pattern there. That's nice. Yeah. So I, I can put content in one database if I want. I can put security somewhere else if I mm -hmm. want. Um, if you want to break that down, but so like your security is in say key vault and your content is in Postgres or something. Exactly. Right. Okay. So security might be, might be Azure active directory at some point. Yeah. Right. So move it around, use that configuration. And this gives me the opportunity to extend and add those features later without putting a whole bunch of if then statements. It's all mm -hmm. configured in one set of places and it just adheres to those, those interfaces and flows through the application all using dependency injection. Okay. I've got one other question for you and this is a selfish question because I've been playing with this on this uh, other app I've been working on is yeah. how are you optimizing page load and like the Blazor download size? Are you using much with like the AOT or the trimming no. or? No, nope. okay. Not at just, all. Just nope. building it out. It's, does it, oh, because of the interactive and the server-side rendering, it's a pretty quick load. You so, got it. Okay. So I don't mind, right? When I, when I first go to the waterfall view, I don't mind when I, when I first bring it up, if it puts up a little spinner and then loads, yeah. I don't, I don't care. And then right. Each one of these is web assembly. It's already load. It's cached. Mm -hmm. it, it's sitting in the browser as well as the modal, right? So cool. loads up nice and quick. That's fast. So I don't have to, the, the on-screen experience then becomes really good because by the time I've navigated to this page, it's already cached all the WebAssembly stuff. Yeah. Wow. It's already there. So um, the, the performance is good enough. Well, especially when you think about as a user, it's pulling all this stuff from all these providers in the background. Anyhow, I mean, I expect some load time, you know, to like, you know, uh, so, it's loading faster than I would have thought it would. You know? Right. So what's what's been amazing to witness is the load time for those six providers in the background. The percent memory utilization and processor isn't that much. Huh. I'm I'm literally less than five ten percent processor on okay. just those services. So take my time. I don't need to optimize just yet. Okay. So there are things that we do need to get to like on the moderation screen. Mm -hmm. If I go back over there, the, there, there is a little bit of slowness as I mouse over things and there's optimizations that we can do there to make that better. And that's just in <laughs> there. There's this, ugly loop that happens where when you mouse over it's a blazer thing to show the overlay it reaches into javascript to turn off the pause button yeah. when it turns off the pause button it calls back into dot net mm. to do something else so it's it's back and internet. forth and back and forth across yeah. we can optimize and put that in one place and this th this mouse over slowdown will go away okay for my purposes right now I didn't notice any slowdown. It seemed fine to me. <laughs> um, okay. So it will, we'll get to it. It's, it's something that folks from the community that want to work on it can tinker with. Cool. Okay. So um, we should wrap up. Uh, let, can you point people to how to get involved? You totally. Know, 
where the project is, that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Let's do that. So this is Tag Zap. You can find it on the GitHub, all things GitHub. At, and um, uh, I, uh, can you post that link into chat? Yeah, GitHub come Fritz and Friends Tag Zap. That's where it is currently. We know that there's going to be more projects coming along here because um, we're going to want NuGet packages for some of the things that folks reuse and create and submit in. But this is where it is now. I have the domain name tagzap.net. That's not running yet, but we'll be getting that up and running soon. If you're interested in, in contributing, and we do have a list of about 19 different contributors now. You can see them here on the side. Nice. Um, there's a bunch of issues. We've got organized and out here. There's some accessibility things. There's some fun things to do, like animated emotes from Twitch. Can we get that going? Um, hey, it'd be great if we could put pronoun indicators on, on some of the tags if folks have opted in and shared pronouns with us. That might be fun to do. Um, better TTV support. Oh, yeah. But little things that, that would be nice to do. These are kind of our priorities. But if folks see things and tinker with, you can you can download and create issues and interact with us. Um, I'm always broadcasting, answering questions, um, building new features onto this on my Twitch stream, Twitch TV slash C Sharp Fritz. I'm also broad syndicating on YouTube, same screen name, YouTube.com, C Sharp Fritz. And at the end of .NET Conf, I read through, I purposely went to the list of contributors for the project and, and to close out .NET Conf, I, I thanked all of our contributors here directly as part of that. It's important to me. If you're going to spend some time and write some code for us, I want to take a little bit and, and thank folks for helping out. So it's wow. growing. It's changing. We're, we're seeing fun things happening, and I'm hoping it continues. Wow, this is great. Well, this is really cool. Um, I'm like, it's great to see an actual real app, like to kind of circle way back to the beginning. This is a real right. app that you've built over time with community. You've learned some lessons. I Absolutely. I learn a lot by reading code and seeing what's working for people. So that's uh, this is I, awesome. I, I think there's there's places here where we're going to create a couple blog posts, a couple of summary vid videos that show, hey, you want to do feature XYZ? Here's how we did it. And here it is in Tags app running. And here it is on, on .NET Conf when we run it live in a production area. Yes. All very cool things that, that my hope is folks look at Blazor, look at ASP.NET and, and what we're able to do and say, this is real. These are things that I can do. And it's yep. not just a pizza store or an e-shop. <laughs> well, it's neat too, because it's a, it's a combination of what you've built and also the developer experience and how productive you're able to be. And, and you know, like looking at that code, it, it reads pretty cleanly and it's nice yeah. to see like the configuration, the providers and all that stuff hooked together. So yeah, very, very cool stuff. All right, well, this is, this is amazing. Um, wow, somebody already saying, does LinkedIn make such to, uh, as a provider? It totally does. Uh, Constantine on YouTube asking that. Mm -hmm. It totally does. There's a problem though where linkedin doesn't make a nice api for us to interact with okay. so i'm going to reach out to our our colleagues that work mm -hmm. at linkedin and talk to them and see if there's a way if there's something that that i can use to link in with them otherwise the the not so friendly way to do it but kind of the brute force way um our friend debbie works on playwright mm -hmm. we can use a little bit of playwright to navigate to, to read, right yeah and yeah. just read the website directly. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, this is great. Um, you have done a marathon this morning. You've been ah, on uh, fun. your live stream and right on to our show. Really appreciate it. Let me know when you're ready to come back on show. Oh, I'll yeah. Excitement. So, Absolutely. This is great. And you know what? Maybe maybe at some point in the future when, when we come back, maybe we can use Tags app to manage some of the messages and oh, things coming in from wow. chat. And we can we can try that out for for a stream or two here Streamyard does a phenomenal job with it and putting the, the stuff at the bottom but maybe maybe next time we yeah. come back and talk about it maybe we actually use tags app to talk about tags app that sounds awesome yeah okay well thanks a lot jeff this is already incredible okay